So I'm a newbie to this conference. I think you need a PhD to work out how to manage the program. Um, that's my takeaway. I didn't sign up to workshops and admissions, so I hope I can join one of them later. Anyway, thank you, Mark, for the introduction. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak with you all today. It's a real honor to be here. Um, and I hope what, I, what I'm going to talk about um, in the next half an hour to allow some time for questions is to sort of set this up quite nicely for the series of panels, lightning talks, uh, workshops, et cetera, et cetera, that are going on over the next couple of days. So it's a chance for us to step back from our day-to-day -day, um, work and really think about things that we can do differently in the future. And that's actually the subject of my talk today. It's really difficult for all of us right now, performing and transforming in our organizations. We're all experiencing a huge amount of turbulence in our working world. We're all being asked to deliver more with less. That might be less people, less time, less money, and more often than not, it's all three. And change is a constant. And as the CEO of IOP Publishing, my job is obviously to implement business strategy effectively, which means keeping the organization moving forward in unison and making sure that the culture is resilient, that it's high performing and that it's open to change. And then wearing my other hat as the current president of the Publishers Association here in the UK, my job is to work with the PA team to ensure that the PA continues to champion publishing to the wider world and to make sure that its members can th thrive today and into the future. So in both of these roles, ensuring the organization I lead is transforming and performing is critical to success. And that's a formidable challenge because if we only transform but don't perform, then we have no here and now. And if we only transform, uh, if we only perform but don't transform, then we have no future. So in my talk, I'm going to elaborate on some of the challenges and opportunities we're facing as a sector and highlight some success factors that will help us survive and thrive. So two quick things to note, I'm going to talk quite a bit about leadership, but when I talk about leadership, I'm talking about a mindset, not necessarily a leadership position. And then also, we're a sector in transition. So I'm hoping that whilst I come from a, a publishing background, I'm hoping that the themes of my talk are equally applicable to librarians, to researchers, university leadership, funders, and everyone else that's engaged in our, in our sector. So you'll all be very well aware of the market dynamics that we're experiencing, the things that are forcing us to get better and be better at what we do, to be more innovative, to be more inclusive. But I think it's just quite helpful to share quite quickly a few of those. So there's a complex array of economic and political challenges. So if you look around, there's inflation, there's labor disruptions, there's the lingering effects of COVID, the spectre of recession, China's slowdown, climate change, war. And let's not forget that 2024 is the world's biggest election year in history. We're all also acutely aware of the challenges to contemporary science, whether that's politicization, miscon misconduct, misinformation or inequalities. And of course, generative AI is everywhere, offering vast possibilities, but huge risks. And a quarter of a century, more than that actually now, of digital transfer transformation has meant we've now reached the data economy. Every organization needs a complete view of its data so that it can use real-time insight to deliver real-time action. And that's leading to a customer experience revolution, with that focus on real personalized marketing that delivers what the customers need at the right time and that frictionless experience and being able to solve their problems quickly. With that, we're looking at a skill shortage, quite frankly. Um, Organisations like ours need different skills to those that we've needed in the past, and that's requiring increased recruitment costs, training costs, upskilling costs. And as much of the work we do gets more automated, organisations are looking increasingly for soft skills such as emotional intelligence, communication, and interpersonal problem solving. 
Mark mentioned hybrid, uh, remote and distributed working is still very much with us um, and still remains well above pre-COVID levels, and I think for good reason. Diversity and inclusion. Um, having a diverse and inclusive workforce in the age of AI is more important than ever when machines are making decisions that impact on humans. And of course, there's a business case for developing sustainable practices. It's not enough just to pay lip service to environmentalism. Green solutions can also lead to bottom line growth. So it would be foolish to try and predict how the long term future is going to look when you see this plethora of um, threats and opportunities in our landscape. So we have our work cut out. We need to think about how to make sure our, our organisations are resilient to shocks whilst also implementing initiatives for long-term growth. <clears throat> and that's a really big balancing act to pull off. So keeping the lights on day to day, but also anticipating and responding to change to make sure that we're viable in the future. But I think there are four really important ways in which the academic sector is strategically aligned to be able to successfully move forward into that future. And these are the four ways that that I've noted. Firstly, our purpose. We have a shared purpose. What we do is really important. We have an incredible impact. Research changes the world. And that purpose is a huge advantage to us when we go back to that skills shortage point that I was making. It helps us to retain and attract the best talent. And that talent's gonna be motivated and engaged to work with us and for us. And that puts us in a really strong position when it comes to innovation and transformational change. We have a common goal to accelerate science. We're all striving for the same thing, and we're unified in that, in that goal to accelerate discovery. The scale and urgency of the challenges we face, though, do require us to work much more collaboratively, and I'll come on to that. I think, too, that we have a collective desire to innovate. And we saw in the pandemic just how quickly the pace of science can accelerate with new technologies that are available today. And we've been quite bound, very bound, by a traditional model that has proved incredibly successful. But what can we do to improve the way that research is shared and disseminated in the future? And last but not least is the imperative that we all have to ensure trust in science. We're duty bound to protect science and its integrity in an age of social media and widespread misinformation. So I'm going to return to these four areas of alignment later in my talk, but first I want to look at what's required for success. What does it take to be successful in this complex and ever-changing environment? When you think about it, we've built our organisations through years of stability, and now we need to thrive through agility. And that sounds corny, but it's so true. Um, we had a very stable business model, very stable way of doing things in our sector for years. And I think there are three components of success. There's technology, there's data, and there's people. And I'm going to talk mostly today about people. And these are, these are my people. Um, they're IOPP's senior leadership team. Uh, who come together every January in our Bristol offices to plan for our, our year ahead. And it's these people that are going to drive the change and to determine how successful we are at navigating this, this future. So at IOPP, we spend a lot of time on our vision, mission, strategy, and the changes that we need to make to the technology, the processes, the products. But now what we're doing is, is looking at our future operating model. So, but what do I mean by that? I mean the organisational design and structure. So what levels and capabilities of people do we need to meet the objectives? How many people do we need? What skills and knowledge? How do we remunerate them? And what ways of working and culture do we need to be successful? And many of those capabilities that we're looking for in our organisations, whether you're a publisher, a library, a research department, are the same. We need skills in change management, data science, technology, AI, and digital marketing. I'm sure there are others, but those are the ones that are front of mind for me. And as I said before, we really need to start looking in different places for, for talent. 
the talent that's traditionally come knocking at our door is not necessarily the talent that we need to be successful in the future. So we have to lay out our stall as an industry. What is our value proposition as an as a academic sector so that we can attract those unique and diverse voices to come and work with us? So for me, business success starts and ends with people, getting the right people in the right roles with the right mindset and focused on the right things. And that right mindset is a growth mindset, a mindset that turns failure and let's face it, quite often fear into courageous action and better decision making. So if I think about the top performers at IOPP, they're undoubtedly those people that are up for a challenge. They love a challenge. They're resourceful, decisive, open-minded. They're willing to accept responsibility and have a genuine interest in others' success. They really understand that we need to move faster as an organization, and that, that means progress over perfection. And is it good enough to, to start? Is it safe enough to try? The other key ingredient is resilience. The best way to make sure our organizations are protected from whatever threat is around the next corner is by making sure our people are more resilient. Thinking positively about those setbacks that we all face and, we don't, and so that we don't learn helplessness. And that's about adapting as we go. And it very much comes back to that culture and in ensuring that we have a culture of trust and accountability. And of course, well-being and resilience go hand in hand. And I just read something recently that said 62% of colleagues have prioritized their work over their well-being. And I know I'm one of those people. Um, most of us live in constant stress uh, and we're often running on empty. So moving self-care higher up our priority lists, it remains an aspiration for me and I'm sure it is for, for many of you too. So that resilience, education and awareness is really important as an element of the, the new learning programme that we're putting in place at IOPP this year. Changes are constant. We need to be able to get up and go again and again and again. It's relentless. Um, the other the other element that I think is, is critical in this unpredictable future is flexibility. So when we don't know what's around the next corner, then we have to remain uh, flexible, of course, and any plan that is overly rigid is just gonna break. And we've seen that a number of times already at IOPP. And one of the big challenges I have is ensuring that our charity parent, the Institute of Physics, have certainty about their long-term plan. So the IOPP derived, uh, sorry, the IOP derives about 85% of its income from the publishing side. And it uses that money to make physics more accessible and inclusive. And this move to an open first future has been long understood and planned for. And they've built up the reserves to deal with this. But equally, the Institute's gonna have to adapt its spending and generate new income during the more fallow years where we're reinvesting more of our publishing profits into transformative initiatives. So there's this inherent instability in a business model change that we're experiencing and the financial profile of the business is gonna be much bumpier as a result. And there's that, that's creating real tension within the IOP group between that flexibility and that planfulness. So we know what investments we want to make but the sequencing and the prioritization of those investments needs to flex in response to what we're seeing in the market and to our financial fortunes. So it's really difficult for me to stand in front of the IOP council and say, in two years time, you will receive this much money from the publishing business. And that's making you know, um, leadership quite a challenging thing right now. But I also want to talk at this point about flexible working very briefly at IOPP. We're a fan of flexible working. We allow employees to work wherever they think can be most productive, but we of course need to balance the business needs in that. So we stress the need for flexibility to colleagues. If they want to have flexible working, they need to be flexible themselves. And each team has a hybrid working charter where they set out between themselves how often they want to meet face-to-face -face in the office. And we talk about different kinds of activities. So we have anchor days, we have focus time, we have collaboration time, learning time. 
And about 18 months ago, we completely reimagined our offices in the UK, China, and in the US. And we really re redesigned them with flexibility and hybrid working in mind. We brought in great coffee, we have sofas, succulents, you name it. It's, it, it does not look like an office that any of us would, would know anymore. And in Bristol, we even have a bar and a, a happy hour every Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And that's been fabulous. We've created magnet offices that people want to come to. Um, and of course, we haven't got it all right. There's still things that we need to tweak and improve, um, but we're learning as we go. And that brings me on to that willingness to learn and how critical that is for business success. So I don't mind saying that I've had my L plates on for the first three years of my time as CEO at IOPP. This is my first CEO job. I think I've probably graduated to P plates now um, in that I've passed my test, but I still don't have huge amounts of CEO experience to draw on. So as leaders and managers, we have to constantly check in that rear view mirror to make sure that our teams are in line, in sight, and doing their part to reach the destination. And then we need to zoom out and look ahead and look at those potential obstacles and make sure that we're on the best route to our destination. Checking our side, side mirrors and our rear view mirrors to make sure that there's no danger. And also adjusting our speed to fit the traffic around us and of course, you sometimes need to look in your blind spots. So what have I learned in my three years as CEO? Well, I've learned to be really clear about who I am as a person, as a leader, what I stand for, what's important to me, what I'm good at, what I'm not so good at. And I've also learned to say that I don't have all the answers and I, I, I don't pretend to, and that collectively we need to come up with these answers. Some of you will know that four months into my new CEO role back in July 2021, I got a breast cancer diagnosis. That really throws you off, I can tell you. I barely stepped into the very large shoes of my predecessor before I'm then in a whole different world of challenge. And suddenly I'm adding myself to the company risk register. Anyway, the point of telling you this is not to garner your sympathy, and nor is it to make myself out to be some sort of hero boss, and I'm fine, by the way, um, but to use it as an illustration of how much we can deal with when we don't think we actually can. Until adversity strikes, you don't realize how strong and resilient you actually are. So you start to focus on what you can influence and change and the things that you can't. Um, and I chose to be very open with everyone at IOPP about what I was going through, and it was undoubtedly showing up every day to work and engaging with all of my colleagues at work that kept me focused on the future. Um, and as, as you go through this, you start to really think about the higher order of things, what's most important, the why. So I've thought a lot about our purpose, our mission, our vision and our values as an organisation, really interrogating what it is that we're, we're here to do and the vital role that publishers play in the growth of science. If you think about those groundbreaking advances in AI, in quantum computing, space and green energy, what an amazing thing to be working for the Institute of Physics, whose members are at the forefront of these discoveries, and to be publishing world firsts in, IOP's foremost, um, in IOPP's internationally respected portfolio of journals, books and scientific news services. So as part of a learned society, the move to open science reinforces our core purpose, which is the advancement and dissemination of knowledge. And the fact that 100% of our proceeds go back into science, I really believe is an increasingly welcome distinction by our communities. For those people for whom a career is more than just a job, and for those people who make brand decisions based on ethical values and beliefs. And some of you, will have seen in the last couple of weeks that IOP Publishing, AIP Publishing and APS, so three physics society publishers, have come together to form a new purpose-led publishing coalition. And this is describing our promise to demonstrate our collective value to the research communities that we jointly serve in what is frankly an increasingly competitive marketplace.
So I've talked about the power of purpose as one of those key areas of alignment. And I now want to talk about the other three quite briefly. So our common goal to accelerate science, our desire to innovate, and our need to ensure trust in science. So conducting science more openly undoubtedly accelerates scientific discovery. But that isn't an end unto itself. How we make research openly available and how it's communicated is critical to the impact it then has on science and society. So research dissemination is a really a planned process and that's what academic publishers do really well. We've poured time and money into developing new ways for students, researchers, librarians and the general reader to find and use our content. And we do that so that we can help researchers maximise their personal contribution to the world's scientific understanding. So that we can help create impact for those investing in R&D. And also we can showcase the best research. And there's nothing like adversity to fuel innovation and positive change. The scholarly publishing community, I think, is exhibiting resilience and identifying new opportunities to support pressing research need. So it's a catalyst for creativity. So we've seen this big uptick in open science policies globally and a proliferation of pathways to openness starting to emerge. Publishers innovating and investing in the next generation open systems and services and developing new models of publishing. This investment increasingly includes the ability for researchers to publish and gain credit for making a wider range of outputs, such as data, code and software available. And whatever the mode of publication, peer review remains the backbone of robust and trustworthy research. And new peer review forms and practices are emerging. So that quality control and managing research integrity are critical. And generative AI, of course, has the ability to scale fraudulent science to an existential level. And the AI-generated rat image published by Frontiers last week, of course, has set the internet alight. So the sector needs to work collectively to develop those robust, scalable and sustainable systems to detect the misconduct and to stop the bad actors actually entering into that publishing ecosystem. There are increasing efforts, too, to revamp the shared infrastructure. Many of you will have seen the um, Ithaca report on the 29th of January, looking at standards, standard systems and tools that can be better um, improved to meet the emerging service needs of different stakeholders. And of course, all of us in this room will be investing heavily in data marketing and analytics, equipping our colleagues with hindsight, insight and foresight to support better experiences for authors and readers. Those capabilities are going to be transformational as we embrace new business models. And whilst publishers alone cannot solve all the inequities that exist in the research ecosystem, we must do everything we can to ensure all researchers have the same opportunity to become authors, reviewers or editorial board members. And that includes finding ways for those that don't have the funds to publish open access. <clears throat> and of course, most of us have very generous APC waiver and discount policies, and we shouldn't um, undervalue that material commitment. But there are more things we could and should be doing, and I think that's going to be an increased focus for us in 2024 and beyond. And many of us, too, take pride in educating and training the next generation of authors, reviewers and editors in new and open ways of working. And finally, of course, publishers are actively promoting and acquiring content that advocates for the themes represented by, S by the SDGs. So lots of game-changing innovation, as well as more regular incremental innovation. And thirdly, I mentioned trust as another aligned area for all of us. We need to think intentionally about trust as a sector, because without trust, the collective action that we need to take around so many of the issues that we face is just not going to be possible. Um, and as the world's research output continues to grow, <clears throat> the role of scientific publications in ensuring trust in access to and impact of science has never been more critical. However, there are many out there who would deny that publishers add value. So changing stakeholders' perceptions around publishing, quite rightly, is a key priority for the industry. 
and we needed to deliberately overcompensate for the negative perceptions that exist by showing not just in word but also in deed that we are genuinely committed to making a success of open science and research ecosystem change. So one great example of positive action is the work publishers are doing individually and collectively to clamp down on that malpractice and fraud in science. The only way to tackle this is to have a united and direct response. And STM has established a committee of industry experts, as many of you will know, to help publishers deal with the research integrity challenges that we're facing <clears throat> on a scale like never before, and to lobby for industry best practice. And that STM group is contributing to lots of other industry programs, including Research to Action, United to Act, COPE, and NISO initiatives. But trust is a really complex issue, and it's not universal, and it varies across different regions. Um, so, for example, there was a survey by University of Oxford and the Wellcome Global Monitor 2020, um, and both of those surveys reported that the pandemic boosted trust in science and scientists. However, a more recent survey by the Pew Research Center in November 2023 found that the share of Americans who say science has had a mostly positive effect on society has fallen, and there's been a continued decline in public trust in scientists. So I think science communication has to be part of the answer to restoring and maintaining trust. Scientists and academics often speak to each other in quite technical language, um, and conducting scientific research, publishing in scientific journals is of, the, is of course really vitally important, but it is insufficient because the academy can't just talk to itself. The truth isn't gonna come out that way or it will be harder to get it out that way because the public hears those voices that speak loudest and most compelling. Um, and I, I hear Charlie Rappel, who many of you will know um, at CUDA, she talks about science needing stories, which I really like as an articulation. So I think scientists together with their institutions and their publishers and a growing number of dedicated services like KUDOS, we need to start turning dry data into compelling stories to actively build that public trust in, in science. So, in conclusion, making progress in a fast-changing and uncertain world is really hard. And when you compound that with the fact that scholarly communication is a really global, complex network of institutions, personal and professional values, incentives, technologies and resources, then the problem is really exacerbated. Undoubtedly, it's going to take a village to make lasting effective change happen. It's going to require collaboration on a whole other level than what we've seen so far. And that's going to require that alignment between stakeholders, that trust in each other to innovate together. Funders, universities, and I'm in including that, of course, university leadership, librarians and researchers, and publishers need to bond together around our mutual interests. That shared purpose that I talked about, our common goal to accelerate science, our recognition of the need to innovate, and that desire to ensure trust in science. And against that backdrop, I'm confident that publishers will continue to matter. Whatever the future holds, there will always be a need for expert validation and filtration services so that users can have that confidence and trust in the information they're consuming. At the moment, those validation and filtration services are peer review and journal brands. But what could it look like in the future? What can we do to improve scientists' ability to discover, read, interpret, share, build upon the outputs of their research? So I feel it's a really inspiring industry to work in, and now is a really exciting time to be part of it. There's so much testing us, but there's so much to be proud of as we evolve at pace to better serve the research community. And I'd like to finish by just playing you another video, I'm tempting fate here, as part of a campaign that the Publishers Association has launched today on research impact and how academic publishers are helping world-leading UK research reach further. What drives me to this research is really curiosity. I hope that this work will help change the narrative on climate change. Hopefully this is not just a wake-up call in women's football or in women's sports in general.
the UK's universities and researchers are world leading, and academic publishers are key partners in research excellence. Every day in academic institutions across the country, researchers are making incredible new discoveries which have the power to positively impact our lives. We spoke to three researchers whose work stood out through publishing. Our work was published in the academic journal Jewel. We found that, rather than being an economic burden, the green energy transition is likely to save us money. Around $12 trillion, in fact. In the two publications that I have in the New Journal of Physics, I am actually looking at how electrons trapped in materials interact with the world around it. We created a paper for sports engineering where we addressed 10 different issues in women's football, amongst which were um, the playing kits, the football boots, um, religious uh, clothing and um, the football pitch. The process of publishing is actually a very important one in our work. It's one way of sharing the science that we do with the world in a way that it's accessible to everyone. Publishing in a journal has allowed us to reach a huge audience. and We've had interest in our methods and our forecasts from all kinds of organisations. The paper was in the 99th percentile of most read scientific papers when published, which was amazing. So obviously it created a lot of attention both by like, players and people in the field, but also by manufacturers and researchers who want to address these issues. As research output continues to grow, the role of academic publications in ensuring trust in, access to, and impact of research has never been more critical. It's our purpose and our privilege to serve the research community. So that's me done. Thank you very much for listening. And I think we have just shy of 15 minutes for any questions people might have. And I understand from Mark there's some roving mics. So opening up the floor. Oh, I've seen two hands up. Mark Allen over there. Can you spot him, somebody? Anthony. Oh, Don. Anthony, can I just take Mark's first? Oh, Would that I, be, I, sorry. I didn't see him. Here. Sorry, I think Mark was first. Then there was a lady over here. Behind you. <laughs> um, Mark Allen, our two our board member. That was great, Antonio, and I knew, I knew it would be um, inspiring. Uh, I just, one of the things that, apologies by the way, to non-publishing colleagues here. This is a publishing question and comment. Uh, one of the things that concerns me, always has done, is innovation. Um, I agree with you, uh, it's, it's a core value, but actually most of the innovations that have changed the industry have come from outside in the end, all the way up to OA, coming from the academy. And I think one of the, the issues is one of your main points, which is about the diversity and quality of the people who come into the industry. Uh, I did a research project with AHRC and Brooks on publishing. Um, and a lot of it was focused on getting feedback from young people about, do you want to join publishing as an industry? Not surprisingly, the answer was no. In a lot of cases, because the perception was elitist, white, middle class and boring, um, which isn't true, of course. But I do struggle with recruitment. I think it's a real challenge. Um, and I just wondered, with all the other great things you're doing, how you're thinking about recruiting to get that diverse workforce that you talked about. Yeah, you, you've hit the nail on the head. It is really difficult. And we haven't done a very good job as an industry as at laying out our stall and, and letting people know about the, the cool, exciting stuff that's happening in our, in our industry. Um, the Publishers Association uh, are doing a good job at trying to get that message out. They sit on various creative industry councils as well and can see some of the techniques that are used by film and theatre and some of the other the industries that we sit alongside. But at IOPP, we, we have spent quite a lot of time um, developing our own employee value proposition and trying to articulate that. And, that. and there are quite a few cynics within the organization that say this is just marketing stuff. You're just putting fancy words on things. 
But I think it does make a difference if you're hunting around for a job, the way we package up the things that we do as an organisation and articulate it in, in fresh and exciting um, vocabulary. Um, and certainly, going back to hybrid working, being a publisher in Bristol means that we have to work quite hard to attract even publishing um, talent into our organisation. So I, th I think I, it's a combination of many different factors. It's outreach in your local communities and wider. It's, I think, offering that flexible working so that you can naturally pull in a, a much wider field of talent. I think it's showing up at different events and different places where the, the talent we need around technology and AI, they don't, they don't know anything about our industry. And yet they could be massive fish in our quite small pond if they came and worked with us as opposed to being one of many at a Google or a Facebook or whatever. So I do think all of us have our own employee value propositions, but collectively we need to do a better job at an industry value proposition. Question over there. So I think it's, is it Lisa? I can't, I can't see you quite from here, Lisa. You're doing very well. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your remarks, Lisa Hinchler from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, I am very taken by the collective consensus statement that you released with your colleagues, let's try over here, um, recently. I'm wondering, um, I always wonder when statements come out, what comes next? And so I'm wondering if you um, can already speak to or reflect on having made this statement, what will be different in your practices, in your own organization, either things that you will no longer be doing because you're reorienting in this way, or things that you'll be adding to your practices as you uh, seek to make this statement something real? Yeah, it, it needs to be deeds and not just words. You're absolutely right. Um, we're early doors. The coalition um, has just been established, and you would be amazed how much governance has to be put in place just to have conversations around a table to make sure you don't fall foul of competition laws etc so it's taken us a year to get to this point and to those few words that you see on the slide so collaboration doesn't always mean you move faster but you move uh, more effectively i think so to answer your question we have a series of um, actions that we've identified and they tend to be more um, greenfield if that's a, a good description of them um, so that we can as, as three organizations build the trust in each other first you know, there's been quite a bit of commentary, James Butcher being one, saying, well, sharing your infrastructure, sharing your platforms, sharing your um, investment costs, that makes sense when you're up against the big competitors. Absolutely, those are things we talk about, but those are really difficult things to start with. So we're starting small um, and we're gonna iterate. And we've also had a number of um, other societies come to us already and say, can we join, can we join? And, and we've said very politely, no. Um, because it's taken us this long to get to this point, we want to get some um, tangible benefits and actions out into the market. So it, uh, initially this is about, again, showcasing who we are and why we think we're different to our shared communities. But beyond that is then looking for opportunities to address some shared challenges together. But it might be around um, cost saving initiatives like we all spend a fortune going to Frankfurt. Why do we all need three different stands? We could just have one stand. That's a very simple thing that we could do to get together better. It might be around how we tackle um, and develop out from APC waivers to address the issues that we see with the global south. That's very uh, time consuming and potentially expensive for us all to do individually because the money's not there but we'd like to be able to do something um, really significant but collectively is this something as a, as a set of organizations we can do together so I, I, I can't really share um, I should, probably shouldn't share um, the full details of the things that we're working on just yet but there, there will be further announcements as we get into our stride and then Anthony I think you had a comment or a question Hello, Anthony Watkinson. <clears throat> um, I'm used to saying cyber research at this point, but I have other hats. And one is as a member of the training committee of ALPS. And what you, that's something you said really interested me. How do you look after yourself in a job, in all the changes going on? And I wonder if you could develop a, what, this a bit, say what sort of thing do you think could be, could be included in a, in, a, in a course on this? 
Uh, I think I think it's really good to focus in on it. I'm I'm not very good at it myself, as as my colleagues on the front row will smile. But we um, we do need to to put radical self care, if you like, higher up the priority list, or we're all going to burn out. Because as I say, we don't have bottomless pockets and people on the bench to to help us with this transformation and performance in years. So. Um, we've got to get better at it, and, and that half of that is recognising the problem in the first place. Um, and then, in our case, we've um, really built out our HR um, team and put a much bigger focus on wellness as one of the benefits that we provide as an organisation. But you can take a horse to water and you can't necessarily make it drink. So I think awareness raising and, and individuals actually um, taking ownership of their own well-being and, and resilience uh, is really important. And as I say, I, I'm, I'm definitely at the beginning of that journey myself. But some you know, health scares like I had gives you a wake-up call and you realise that you're not invincible and you're entirely replaceable. <laughs> Any other questions? Jignesh. Thank you for this wonderful talk. We really appreciate it. In terms of the alliance, uh, two questions. Um, do you see that more happening in other societies? And was there a huge amount of overlap with your members and AIP publishing members and APS? I mean, what what was it? I mean, can you give us some sense? And just a comment on what Mark said in terms of employees and innovation. Uh, one of the things I'm increasingly seeing is not necessarily publishers want to bring all employees in-house. It's tough to compete with the Googles and the Microsofts of the world if you want to bring AI. So people are looking at India as more not just production centers, but also thought partners in AI and ML. So it may be also a collaborative approach than just building all capabilities in-house. But that's a, just a separate comment. But yeah, if you can... Well, um, it's a separate comment, but again, at the risk of revealing too much, AI is absolutely one of those areas that as a, as a coalition we want to look at together because, as I say, it's greenfield, it's expensive, we don't have the capabilities individually, let alone probably collectively. So what can we do with our corpus of content uh, and who can we partner with to look at you know, possibilities that might come out of that content in terms of new products and services? but also productivity tools for our, for our teams, whether that's making it easier to find peer reviewers, whether that's just helping you code something in technology. There's so many different um, potential areas that we could collaborate on. Actually, the problem at the moment is just narrowing it down and getting something done as, as three organizations. And to answer your question, yes, our, there is big overlap in our not necessarily in our membership as societies, but of course in our authorship and our, our readership, because we're all global publishers. So I think there's a there's a real shared benefit to those physical science communities in, in us acting as one where we can. Mark's looking at me, so I think time is up. Yes, Thank you very you. much for your attention. Uh, we're going to ask the group time keeping you, I'm afraid. So I'm sure you've got more questions so you can badger and turn with later. Um, but uh, can I just ask you to all join me in thanking her for her really interesting presentation.